Parenthood is a time of so much change for you and your baby. A little reliable information can go a long way towards making this new life a good life. I'm Jessica Rolf, and this is My New Life, a Love Every Podcast. Babies are born wondering. They have to piece together the world around them by gathering information. And they do this by observing, experimenting, and asking questions. In this way, children are like little scientists. If you have a toddler in the house, there's no shortage of questions in your daily conversations. But is it a two-way street? How many questions are you asking your toddler? Dr. Sarah Lytle joins me on today's episode. She is Director of Outreach and Education at the Institute for Learning and Brain Sciences at the University of Washington. She says parents have a critical role to play in scaffolding early learning in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And this starts with asking questions of your toddler. Hello, Sarah. Hi, Jessica. It's so great to have you here. I'm so excited to explore what does STEM learning look like for toddlers? Sure. So STEM, so science, technology, engineering, and math is really a set of skills that hang together because they have a common way of thinking, exploring, and creating for kids. So STEM skills use evidence to gain knowledge. You're creating new things. You're solving problems. And toddlers are using STEM skills constantly. If you think about you know, what the job of toddlerhood is, it's really to make sense of the world around them. And that very fundamentally involves STEM skills. So if you think about children as little scientists, they're performing these experiments over and over again to see what happens and to see what rules kind of govern the world that's around them. If you, you know, think about a child learning to walk, for example, you know, they're constantly learning about physics. They might have fallen and then gotten back up and tried to walk again, figured out that, you know, balancing on one leg is harder than standing up on two legs. You know, children are, you know, dropping toys constantly. If you're a parent who's ever had, you know, the, the endless dropping of the sippy cup, you know, that is physics at its fundamental level. And that's part of STEM. And then I read that early math skills, like the strongest predictor of later school achievement. Does your research support that finding? Yes, it's so interesting, isn't it? So what we see is that preschoolers' math skills predict both third grade reading and third grade math scores. And if you think about what that compares to, in contrast, if you look at a preschooler's early reading skills, that's only predictive of later reading skills. Not to say that reading's not important, it certainly is. But there's something about these early math skills that seem to harness some general skills that help children learn across domains. And so math is really integral. And if you think about why that is, you know, math and a lot of these STEM skills really get you to this idea of of asking questions and being curious and learning about the world. And because you can incorporate math into anything, including reading, which I hope we'll talk about later, it really allows you to build skills not only in math, but in a wide range of domains. And so it's one of those reasons that, you know, helping children with those early math skills is just so very important. Okay. So I love what you brought up that asking these questions, even while reading, help me make this come alive for me. If I'm a parent of a toddler, how do I really do this in my home? How do I make math part of every day? Well, we like to think of math as being everywhere. It is absolutely incorporated into anything that a child is doing, particularly in these early years. If you think about reading, for example, you know, there are certainly certain books that focus on math and that's great, but you don't need a math book to talk about math with books. On any page of a book, you can count the number of characters. You can talk about comparisons, which character is taller than another character. That's math skills. You can talk about, you know, the number of categories Categories. If you're reading a book that highlights a grocery store, you know, how many red apples are there and how many green apples are there? Categories are math. So you really can start to integrate this kind of language in any of those interactions you have with a child. It could be reading, but it could be bath time. It could be, you know, while you're preparing dinner. Any of those interactions can really, you know, with your language as a parent or caregiver, can really become rich math interactions. 
So I read that in one study that children learn more about shapes when an adult guided their play rather than instructing them or letting children play on their own. Can you tell me about what this actually looks like, the guided play versus instructing? And then can you tell me more about what the study found? Absolutely. And this really goes back to the heart of what we talked about before, this idea that children are explorers and they really need to be able to be that active explorer in their world. And so if you think about some of this research that you're that you're referring to, they looked at the difference between sort of this direct instruction versus guided play and also looked at some free play for children. And what, you know, direct instruction is really, you can kind of think of the, you know, classic school classroom uh, atmosphere where there's an expert and they're talking at you and, you know, this is the way to do it. And there's only one way to do it. And this is how you're going to do it. And, you know, perhaps not a big surprise. Children don't actually learn all that well from that method of instruction, particularly in those early years. When learning really comes alive for children is in this guided play and to a certain extent in the free play situations, though guided play is oftentimes helpful for learning new concepts and expanding children's repertoire. And so guided play is a situation where, you know, a parent is going to scaffold, provide that support for a child when they're engaged in a particular activity. And so with, with block play, for example, you might talk, you know, show me which one is longer or what do you think would happen when you're asking lots of these open-ended questions for children and that really kind of push them to maybe think about things differently. If a children's natural inclination with blocks is to always, you know, build, build the tower. The tower is great, but let's think about what else we can build. If we wanted to build a house, how do you think we would build a house? If you wanted to build a bridge, how would we build a bridge? How do we get the middle of the bridge to stay up? Uh, you know, How do we support it? Lots of those kinds of questions that really kind of push children to expand their, their repertoire of knowledge and think about things in new and different ways. And the study that you're talking about did this with some shape learning and thinking about how kids might start to learn the properties of different shapes. And it turns out that this kind of guided play was most effective for children learning that, you know, hey, a triangle has three points and three sides that are all connected. And, you know, once they've engaged in this this kind of guided play with questions and the ability to explore and kind of tinker with it for themselves, kids are much more able to, you know, understand that a triangle doesn't have to be that classic, you know, equilateral triangle with a point, you know, pointing north. But the fundamental point of this certainly is that this kind of guided play when adults and caregivers can really start to push children to think about things in different ways, ask those open-ended questions, that seems to be really useful for children's learning. Yeah, I remember when my children were just becoming kind of more verbal. I realized that I was doing so much narration, but also instruction. And I wasn't doing as much of this sort of question asking. How do you kind of have this shift mindset shift? I found, you know, instead of pointing out, oh, look at that building over there, the building is red. What else could I say in that moment? Yeah, absolutely. And I will say that narration is very good and narration has, you know, a, a time and a place. I think particularly for children who are pre-verbal and not really speaking a whole lot yet, narration is fantastic. And narration is even good in the toddler and preschool years, if you particularly if you're uh, narrating what a child is doing. So if a child is engaged in something and they're, you know, really, you know, engrossed in whatever they're playing with, you know, narrating it can kind of give language to what they're doing. Like, oh, I see that you know you've you've stacked these in in order of biggest to smallest or oh you've put the red blocks over here and the blue bo blocks over here but certainly as we think about the kinds of questions that we can ask children it's a lot of the who, what, where, when, why kinds of questions. And so if you're, you know, out on a walk in the world, that's a bird over there. What color is the bird? Where do you think we might see another bird? Why do you think we oftentimes see birds in trees? Do you think it might be because they live there? Where else have we seen birds? Start to connect it and, and make those connections. Perhaps you've read a book recently that had a bird in it. Think about the comparisons of the bird in the book and the bird that you saw on your walk out in the world. Again, helping a child understand that a, 
bird can exist in a book and it can exist in the real world. And so as you're starting to ask those questions and tell me more, and what do you think? And why do you think that might be? I think one of the things that's most challenging for us as adults is to get out of this space of thinking that we need to be the experts about things, because that's certainly not true. And in fact, the more that we can demonstrate to children that we are learners alongside them, the more children are actually going to persist with tasks later on. Once they understand that it's okay to make mistakes, it's okay to not know the answer to everything. That gives children confidence, in fact, to explore and to make their own mistakes and to learn from them. And so, you know, that is a fundamental shift for adults who, you know, oftentimes like, you know, we are, we are that teacher. We, you know, have been on the earth for many, many decades. And, you know, how can we show children, uh, you know, all the things that we know? And that's great, but perhaps better to think about being a curious learner alongside children. I love that because I think for me, uh, oftentimes I I do put myself in this sort of like, I'm the professor, <laughs> you know, you're my student. And I think that what I realized and I'm re- re-realizing in, in talking to you is that these open-ended questions, like you might have an agenda when you say, why do you think birds are often in trees? Like you might have an agenda as to what you think the answer is, but mm-hmm. really kind of having that open mind and being in that space to explore how they answer that question and making that valid for them and adding another hypothesis, you know, creates this sort of inquiry in the scientific mind um, Mm -hmm. so much more than what color is the bird? Blue. No, it's red. You know, it's, it's like the type of questions and how you ask them to it. There's a nuance to it. And I love hearing you explain that. Absolutely. And I would just add, as you suggest, that, you know, ask questions that you legitimately don't know the answers to. And that's that's a great way to, well, I wonder if, and, you know, have those conversations. And it's okay to not, you know, land on the answer. I think that, you know, sometimes with the internet at our fingertips, we're, we're so accustomed to, you know, landing on a particular answer at the end of a conversation. But that certainly doesn't have to happen. And in fact, kids learn from it when it doesn't happen. You know, kind of being comfortable in that uncertain state. And so let's get grounded in something like water play, something so simple. Mm -hmm. Based on everything we're talking about, they're not just playing, but they're learning some key scientific skills. Can Mm -hmm. you bring to life what are these skills and what are some questions parents can ask when they see their children splashing around? Sure. I love water play. I think you can do so many things with water. You can paint with water. You can have water in a bucket and splash around in it. And, you know, as children are exploring water, they're learning the properties of water. You know, how does water behave when you drop something in it? If you're a parent or caregiver, you might wonder along with your child to say, you know, if we drop this rock in, do you think it's going to be a bigger splash or a smaller splash than the pebble that we dropped in? Or, you know, what do you think will happen if we put the apple in the water? You know, one of the best ways, or I think a classic example of water play is playing the the sink or float game. (laughs) So collecting a bunch of things and having a bucket full of water and predicting, you know, which of these things are going to sink, which are going to float. How do you know? Why do you think that? You know, why did the sponge float and the rock sank to the bottom? You know, think about that theory development. This is all math, science, STEM, all of that, you know, wrapped up together. I love introducing a variety of really open-ended tools or toys that you can use in water. If you think about cups, you can think about pouring water back and forth. You know, how many cups cupfuls of water is it going to take to fill this other bucket? Predict, you know, then do it and see how close you got. And, you know, wonder and and, and marvel at how close you were, or how far away you were. And that's that's okay. It's the the point is going through that routine and having that experience. Yeah, it's so fun. Pouring is just amazing to see how their brains work to figure out when am I over pouring. So we have some different <laughs> sized containers at Love Every, and you know it's really teaching children to control and understand, like and and judge and predict when is this going to spill over. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I also remember I remember having this moment with my baby where I was really trying to teach my the older baby, young toddler, about the difference between heavy and light. I really craved having like an example because a rock is heavy and a feather 
other is light, but they're two totally different things. And so Mm -hmm. we have these two balls at Love Every that are identical. And one of them is really heavy. The other is light. And then one of them, you know, sinks in the bath, the other floats. And I love hearing these questions that we could ask to really enrich that learning as opposed to just, oh, look, the, you know, the heavy ball is sinking. There's all these ways to, you know, ask why and what else do you think will sink? And why do you think it sinks? So, Mm -hmm. so fun to bring that kind of science at home. What about technology? We tend to associate technology with screens, but what kind of technology learning are you promoting at iLabs that is screen free? Sure. I mean, you know, technology certainly incorporates, you know, cell phones and computers and all of that, but it's not just that. You know, technology also encompasses other man made objects that help us accomplish things in the world. And so you can think about things like uh, wheels or levers, scissors, or even spoons. You know, spoons are an interesting one, but they're an, an invention that humans created to help get liquidy foods into our mouth. And so it's a kind of technology. You know, when children are playing with these tools, oftentimes what we see with technology is that children are really exploring cause and effect. So if I do something, what effect is that going to have on the world? And you might think about, you know, the ways and the very creative ways that children invent and use to get things that that are, you know, potentially out of their reach. They might use a stick to, you know, grab that ball and, you know, start it rolling toward them so that they can grab it. Or they might use scissors and they cut that piece of construction paper and they see that they had an effect on the world. And that's a really important piece of learning in those early years, this cause and effect relationship. And tools are oftentimes the way that kids get to that. And we think about tools, there's also what kind of tools can support, you know, spatial awareness. On the iLab site, a study was referenced that found that children whose parents exposed them to more spatial language, like above, below, you know, inside, outside, performed better on a spatial test, a spatial awareness test. And so like we have a hammer set in our two-year-old play kits, for example, and there's some cards that a child can prop up and then try and match the the two-dimensional world to the three-dimensional world that they're hammering these little pegs into a set. How is a hammer set actually helping them explore concepts, spatial awareness concepts with their child? And how else can we support that kind of spatial understanding and learning? Mm -hmm. Spatial awareness is such an important part of this this early STEM learning. You can think about spatial awareness as being everything from, you know, what fits inside something else to, you know, as an adult, you know, where did I park my car in the parking lot? Having that sense of how to navigate back to your car, a very important life skill. But for children, you know, things like a hammer set you know, hammers allow you to put something into something else. And there's a little bit of, you know, does it fit? And, you know, as we start to think about the language that surrounds these kinds of interactions, spatial language is things like in and out, on top of, beside, things that describe those spatial relationships between two or more objects. And so as parents and caregivers, we can start to really, you know, do some narration about this, but also start to ask questions. You know, if you want to build that block tower, where does this next block need to go? Does it need to go beside the other block? Does it need to go on top of the other block? Yeah. And one of the things that we researched and understood at Love Every and all of our parent testing is we discovered that the parents expected too much of their children's block play too early, if you will. They kind of imagine their two-year-old building like elaborate castles or even like the three-year-old. And when they're really, you know, kind of focusing on stacking, you know, six blocks on top of each other at that age, for example. So what kind of advice do you have for parents around block play and how parents can really kind of get engaged and help their children to discover the, the joy and the learning through block play? Locks. Yeah, you know, I think everybody sometimes needs a little bit of inspiration. And, you know, sometimes you're inspired to build that castle out of blocks and sometimes you're not. You know, and one thing that I love to think about across domains, whether it's blocks or, you know, books and, you know, walks out in the park is really kind of connecting experiences for kids. And so it may be that you're going to read a book and, you know, in the book, the character visits the doctor's office. You know, perhaps then after you read the book with your child, you're going to get out the blocks and say, let's build the doctor's office or, you know, another aspect of the book that the child really started to connect to. And in this way, you can start to follow the child's lead, think about what they're really interested in, but then you're connecting those experiences over time, which we know is really good for reinforcing a lot of those core concepts with kids. 
I love that. I'm so inspired to now play with blocks in a different way with my five-year-old. I think that that will actually get her more engaged because I, I do find it's like tricky. I'm like, I want her to play with blocks. I want her to understand structure and support and all these things, but sometimes it's hard to get her activated. Speaking of girls and women, women continue to be underrepresented in the STEM fields. And so it's particularly important for little girls to get positive experiences in STEM from an early age. What do you recommend? Well, a couple of things are really coming out of our research. I think, you know, one, we know that uh, girls need to see representation. And as parents and caregivers, we can start pointing that out. You know, when we go to the zoo, for example, and we see uh, zoo workers who are women, we can talk about how they are scientists. That's what they are doing at the zoo. If you have a female doctor, talk about, you know, how that that doctor is a scientist and, and doing some, you know, really important work. And so I think part of it is is sort of making those representations, those moments of representation very obvious and explicit. The other thing to do is, you know, I think as adults, we oftentimes, for whatever reason, um, think that we have permission to say things like, oh, I'm not really good at math. It's sort of an interesting thing because it's not as if we would ever say, oh, I'm not really good at reading. You know, it's somehow societally unacceptable to say we're not good at reading, but it is acceptable to say we're not good at math. And we can start to tweak our own language and what we say around our children. And one thing that helped me because I have to say I did fall prey to the stereotype of, you know, I just am not enjoying math, but the word yet. So with my children, Mm -hmm. if I find that, you know, my, my older children are, you know, practicing their times tables and they're in the 12s or in the, in the 14s or they're, you know, later we'll be doing differential equations or whatever. I can always say, you know, I'm not really good at that yet. Yet, Mm -hmm. (laughs) still working on it. So what did your parents do to get you excited about science? Yeah, well, I, I love the addition of yet. I think that's so important. And, you know, as we know, growth mindset is is all the rage, this idea that that you can improve your own abilities in a particular area. So I love that addition. You know, and I think in my household, when we were growing up, we did a lot of uh, curiosity and exploration of, of the world. And I think that was really important. I, I will say that I think the thing that really got me into math and science was cooking and baking. I come from a long line of cooks and bakers, and we were forever, you know, doubling recipes or having recipes and thinking about, you know, what happens when you add the baking soda. And that's oftentimes an explosion of sorts. But I think that's that's really what what got me into, into math. I love that you brought up baking. What other activities can we do with our toddlers that really bring math and science and engineering to the forefront? You know, I think one of the best things about STEM is that it really does happen all day, every day. You know, there is one study that I love to cite and reference because it finds that preschool age children explore or use math related concepts about half of the time when they're engaged in free play. And what that tells me is that kids are already engaging in a ton of math and other STEM activities. And so the challenge for us as caregivers and parents is is not so much to create new opportunities for STEM learning, it's to recognize the opportunities that are already presenting themselves. And so when you think about, you know, children who are, you know, perhaps, you know, dressed up in princess costumes, playing with a castle, but all of a sudden they start talking about, well, this doll has to be the daddy because he's taller or he's bigger. That's math, you know, in complete princess costume, but that's math. And so I think the more we can start to recognize some of those opportunities that are already present and how some of these concepts can fit into everyday opportunities, like, you know, we talked about baking and cooking, a great time for STEM. You know, I like to think about, you know, folding laundry. You know, if your child, if you can get your child to help you fold laundry, put them in charge of socks, you know, as they're pairing socks, that's category building and that's math. You know, we talked about water play, that's bath time. So it's not so much about creating these new or different opportunities for math and other STEM skills. It's really thinking about infusing that kind of language, infusing that curiosity and exploration and that, you know, almost scientific method, those, you know, who, what, why, when, how questions into those everyday activities that we're already doing. You know, and of course, I think that's always a nice thing for parents to hear as, you know, we are are constantly overscheduled and very, very busy. But so it's not so much this idea that you need the new thing, the, the new activity. Just you, think about how you can infuse this into what you're already doing. I love that, Sarah. You've been so helpful to us today. Thank you so much for being with us. Well, thank you. 
What luck. STEM is everywhere and our toddlers are naturally drawn to it. Takeaway number one, STEM learning really comes alive during guided play. You can support that learning by asking questions and fuse those why and how questions into everyday activities. I wonder, and what if are also good ones. How can we get this bridge to stay up? What if we had a block here? It helps children to think about things in new and different ways. Takeaway number two, while reading with your child, don't forget to incorporate math. Count the pages, numbers of objects, or talk about comparisons. Which character is taller than the other? Preschoolers' math skills predict both third grade reading and math scores. Takeaway number three, humans are social beings. We reinforce our learning by sharing it. When toddlers talk about what they see around them and are interacting with you, they are making important brain connections. On a walk, ask your child, where do you suppose those birds are going? Where else have we seen birds? As they explore water, ask, if we drop this rock in the water, will it make a bigger or smaller splash than the pebble? Don't feel like you need to be an expert. It's okay to not have the answer. The more you can demonstrate that you are learning alongside them, the more you will foster curiosity in your child. You can find more STEM activities on the Love Every blog at loveevery.com. You've been listening to My New Life. If you think this episode might be helpful to a fellow parent, please share. And if you'd like to learn more about the topics discussed in today's show, head over to loveevery.com. That's L-O-V-E-V-E-R-Y.com. I'm Jessica Rolfe. Thanks for listening.